It's a privilege to have uh, our friends, uh, Nobu Tanaka. You know him very well. He's a very important person in the world of energy. He was, is the former um, head of the International Energy Agency and, above all, a very good friend. Thank you very much for being here uh, with us. Uh, David Sandalo, a very distinguished colleague. He was the Under Secretary for Energy in the uh, in President Obama's administration. Uh, not least, Pedro Ferreira, who is the head of the Strategy and Planning Department of EDP. EDP is a utility of my own country, Portugal, but he's heavily present here in the US. They are the number three wind power uh, operator. And Pedro is responsible for a number of strategy games that we've played here uh, to, to project um, energy and CO2 emissions uh, in 2050 in China, and now we are in the process of adapting this same model for the US and for Europe. So um, I challenge that in one year time, Nobu, you'll come again, if you don't mind. And we will do the second China Sustainability Forum, and we can even compare China, the US, and Europe based on, uh, on our model. So thank you very much for coming. Nobu, please. Uh, thank you, Manuel, and thank you, Jason, of always arranging many things for me as um, head of the center. He's a very demanding boss for us. <laughs> David Sandalo, yes, I worked with him when I was uh, head of IEA, and uh, he was magnificent um, secretary, under secretary of, of energy, and we always worked together in many places. And China is one of the very important targets. Manuel is, uh, you know, I worked with him he, when he was a Minister of Energy of the Portugal. And I, uh, as a sec executive director, I visited uh, the country many times because uh, their reform in the country and uh, moving toward renewable is one of the very interesting model for many of the uh, IEA countries. So this is great honor for me to come again and work with uh, Manuel. Uh, and I, I always respect him. He's a great um, energy minister uh, whom I, I, I knew for years. So I'm very happy to come back and uh, tell you about something. And it, it, last night I made a lecture on the share revolution and energy security. Today I will talk a little more about uh, China. Maybe uh, some of you came to the lunch on session today, the Brownback lunch. So, well, more and more people come uh, realize what I'm going to say. So I try to be slightly different uh, in focusing more China. Tomorrow, uh, I will talk about uh, nuclear power and uh, what is uh, necessary uh, of the nuclear power for the security, sustainability, etc. Let's do it quickly. That. Uh, <laughs> What I have, uh, I want to say is the shale revolution is is certainly very important uh, uh, issue for China. Not only it's within China the shale uh, revolution may happen, but also the American North American shale revolution has certain impacts on China too. Yes, this chart is uh, as usual introduction. That China is certainly the big energy game changer. Not only India, but Middle East. China has three times more impact than India for the global energy sphere. Yes, and uh, fossil fuel is always a challenge for anybody because 75% of the energy be fossil. Even in 2035, China needs fossil energy competing with other Asian economies. And this is interesting chart. Because China and India occupies very significant part of the energy growth from now to 2035. And the risk is in oil. Of course, coal is abundant. There's a problem of carbon dioxide. Uh, but the oil is limited resources. And most of the increase of the demand happens in China and India in the world. And this is a very much of the concern for everybody because this graph shows the U.S. is a sole winner in the share revolution. The independence 
dependence on oil and gas will decline dramatically uh, as an importation, and even the gas will become the exportation from the United States. So U.S. trade balance will be improved, competitiveness of industry will be improved dramatically relative to the other countries. How to China react to this? Buying more fossil fuel or conservation or renewables? Yes, for Japan and Korea, the challenge is enormous. Already 100% import dependence means it cannot be worse. And how Japan compete with China and the US without nuclear power? This is always my message to my colleague back in Tokyo. Iraq is important, but the important thing is its export is going to China and India. And US no longer needs oil from Middle East. Maybe still oil will come for the refineries of uh, Saudi Aramco here in the United States. But statistically, US will no longer need any oil from Middle East. Will it change? the position of the United States to the Middle East peace as well as free navigation of the Hormuz Strait? Probably not. US still has a strong interest in the peace of the Middle East and free navigation of the Strait. But certainly US will ask other free riders to share the burden, China, India, Korea, Japan, if something happens. So what is the structure of the uh, uh, energy security in the future. China's import of oil and gas, China's preference is pipeline because it's much more secure. More than half of the gas at this moment imported to China through pipeline. But Silane is, again, very important. The dependence of Chinese on the Hormuz Strait is more than 40% on Maraca Strait is more than 80%. Sea lane protection is certainly critical interest for China by aircraft carriers, submarines, missiles, and that makes some concern to the neighboring countries as well as the United States. How China try to secure the transit rule is not only China's problem, but for everybody else. IEA has a strategic stockpile, but this is not enough to really protect something happens in Hormuz Strait. Because in the future, the import of India and China will certainly exceed that of OECD as a whole. So if China and, and India are not joining IEA, how could IEA continue its influence over the global energy market? I asked Henry Kissinger to convince Chinese leaders to join IEA. It was not that successful. Co cooperation, collaboration is happening, but not through membership to, and commitment of China to the IEA yet. But it's definitely China's interest to work with IEA because high price and volatility of the price of oil supply is the problem, much more serious problem for China than the United States. Golden age of gas comes, but only when China expands substantially its production. It's a Chinese issue. China is very hard to work on the shale gas. I visited the first shale gas well in China, in Chandong, nearby Chandong, in Sichuan province. Very serious, still problems. The structure is deep, different from United States the availability of water, not in Sichuan, but in other places, and price control of gas or electricity certainly hamper the further development of shale in, the, in China. National targets for 12th year plan is very ambitious. Small increase of share of gas means global, globally a very big amount it is 230 BCM. Chinese ex in, uh, in increase of demand is surpassing everybody else. It has a significant impact to the global market, not only in China, but everybody else. 
global market will change dramatically by shale revolution. There are much more complex flow of gas will happen. How to secure the gas supply is certainly a very interesting question. Russia will play a very important role with pipeline, LNG, etc. And China is preparing for different strategies for strategic channels, they say. This is a chart by the CNPC. I got a map by the CNPC. And LNG from northeast, from northwest, from Myanmar, strategic planning is moving in China for pipeline construction. Price of gas is always issue. I don't want to go get in too much. Uh, you know what it means. I explained yesterday. There are three zones after share revolution for the prices. Asia or Japan paying four, five times more prices of gas than the United States. How can we make it cheaper? We must work together. China must work with other Asian countries to pressure down the prices of gas. It's their own interest to work with other importers. US is in a very good position. The higher the oil price, the gas price will be lower because the liquid content can be sold, which with the wet gas can be sold, the wet part of the gas can be sold as an oil price. So the higher the oil price, gas break-even cost or price will be lower. So this structure make the price indexing of gas to the oil make irrelevant. The importer of gas or LNG must change their pricing formula. Otherwise, these countries will suffer. Asia has a huge disadvantage against the United States of this high energy or high gas price for the future. US will start exporting, yet it will help these importers to diversify the sources and also asking for cheaper price. This is very strategic move of US of sending LNG somewhere else. China may import, Japan may import, Korea may import, but this is a very interesting moment starting changing the formula of the price. Japan is asked to give up this destination clause or dispose the destination limitation clause. Japan is paying 10 billion barrels, 10 billion dollars more than Europe by this destination restriction. China should work with Japan and Korea to get rid of this kind of anti-competitive practices, which was forbidden by the European Commission as a rule. Why not Asian country can do the same? I don't want to go into too much winners or losers, which this IEEJ, my affiliation in Japan, is telling us who are the winners of the share revolution. Yes, United States is the largest winner, but other Latin America, Oceania, producers of shell will be winners. While former Soviet Union or Russia or Middle East are losers because generally the price of oil gas will gradually decline thanks to the expansion of the shale oil and gas. China is winner, of course, because of the lower price of gas and oil. Japan too. But golden ages of gas needs a lot of implementation of much more environment-friendly measures and uh, regulation, and it means more cost. Yes, Japan is trying this methane hydrate, next generation unconventional source. Electrification is the issue, because the future of the energy be provided through electricity. But to, to get the electricity to the demand side, yes, you need huge investment for grid and generation. The Chinese investment is enormous relative to other countries. The cost is there. Renewables, nuclear, gas, coal, you name it. 
huge investment is necessary to sustain the demand increase in electrification in China. This is the different power generation in China in the IEA outlook. Coal is certainly very important, but coal should be clean to be utilized. So carbon capturing and storage would be very important technology for China. N nothing much more than any other country, the China needs CCS. Nuclear, yes, nuclear power, China is planning to build major part of the additional nuclear power in the world. But it should be safe operation. After Fukushima, China should learn the lesson of this accident seriously. Otherwise, Japan also suffer because not PM 2.5 or yellow sands may come from China. If accident happens, radioactive cloud may come. So Japan is ready to help China with our lessons we learned in Fukushima. New technologies, integral fast reactor, pyroprocessing, this is the subject tomorrow morning. But tonight, Robert Stone will show you the very interesting movie, Pandora's Promise, at CNN, 9 o'clock. Please take a look at it if you want to come tomorrow's session on the nuclear power for the future. We will have the Yun Chan, who is one of the architects of this pyroprocessing here tomorrow. And he will tell us what is this technology is all about. China is also interested. Cost of renewables is very high. Already committed, which is coming. And this makes the cost of electricity higher in the future. This is not only problem for anybody else, but also for China. Because the cost incurred in China is increasing. In Europe, it may decrease, but certainly the big deployment of renewables is a problem for China. Because the more that you have variable renewables, yes, design of market, and also technology of the grid or backup facilities is necessary to accommodate renewables. So this, is, this means additional cost for China. Price, still Chinese price of electricity be lower than other country. But certainly it is increasing. And efficiency is going to be much, much more important for China. I will give several burdens. Import burden will increase, of course, for fossil in China. Relative to other countries, you can easily see how fast this import burden happens for China. This chart shows very interesting. This is a US net oil import reduction. Half of this reduction comes from shale revolution, increase of the shale pro oil production, light tight oil production. That's a purple part. But other half of this energy independence of the United States be explained by the energy efficiency, the yellow part, which comes from the very stringent fuel standard for the car. So efficiency is very important for the US, but also for China, of course. Car ownership increased dramatically in China. This is the reason for the fossil demand in China. The oil savings, if the fuel standard is very tough. It happens substantially also in China, not only US. Electricity demand will decline if efficient use happens. IEA make an efficiency world scenario. That gives you a very good idea where the efficiency could happen. China is a definitely benefited by the efficient use of energy. This is also the same. In a, if energy efficiency happens, yes, China will certainly save a lot of money relative to the most likely scenario, the new policy scenario. GDP growth will be very big by this energy efficiency. 
For that, one thing China should do is this eliminating consumption subsidy of fossil fuel. China is the fifth largest user of fossil fuel subsidy. Get rid of price control of oil, gas, electricity. This is difficult, but very necessary process that China should do. Another point is energy security be warranted if it's done collectively. This is a European case. The countries are ranked by the self-sufficiency rate of fossil fuel and renewables. Those countries without high fossil fuel or uh, renewables supplement the situation by nuclear power, the yellow part. But Europe has very different, each country has very different policy mix, while as a whole, European 27, second from the bottom, shows that the 50% self-sufficiency with very well diversified sources, renewable, fossil, and nuclear. But this is not only average, because European countries connect to each other by grid lines, electric grid lines, as well as gas pipeline. So sharing the electricity and gas and the reducing the risk, this is the model for collective energy security for the future. Pipelines, grid lines, and even it's connecting to North Africa, Energy for Peace, Desertec project. Yes, there is a blueprint for North East Asian gas pipeline infrastructure. This is designed by Dr. Hirata of Japan and proposed to Russia, Mongolia, Korea, Japan, China's experts. They are meeting from 1995 on, but China is smart enough to take this blueprint very serious and built the pipeline from Tarim Basin to Shanghai, from Turkmenistan to Tarim Basin, Myanmar to China. So pipeline system infrastructure is being built. And I was told when I saw many of the experts that, yes, we are so thankful for Dr. Hirata for proposing this. Unfortunately, this is not happening around Japan itself. This is a problem. So my, I am strongly urging Japanese government take seriously connecting Japan to Russia by pipeline. And this will diversify our sources and also stable supply is warranted. Grid line connection is proposed by Masayoshi Song. He's the owner of SoftBank, now the owner of Sprint. And he is trying to import uh, gen uh, electricity from Mongolia generated by wind. Russia wants to sell the power from generated by uh, hydro to Japan. So this kind of connection of super grid in Asia certainly makes the Asian economies closer together and enhancing energy security. So my point is, yes, the short-term issues of energy security in uh, Strait of Hormuz, we have to prepare for that. Technologies is very important. Nuclear power plays a role, but most of all, Yes, collective energy security, working together in IEA, or working together for reducing the price of gas by new formula, or collective energy security by connecting grid lines, pipelines with your neighbors, certainly China can play a very, very important role. And for me as a Japanese, I strongly believe that we don't have to waste our time, important time, by disputing over very small irons or rocks in between. Thank you very much. My name is David Sandalow. Uh, thank you, Manuel, for organizing this. Thank you, Jason, for launching this center, which has got just an extraordinary series of events underway. If you haven't already looked at what the center is doing in November, it's, it's amazing. Um, uh, and, and the research underway at the center is very exciting as well, so thank you. Um, thank you, Jesse and Ku and others who work behind the scenes to make this possible. 
Um, and it's kind of sobering to talk after Nobuo Tanaka, I have to say. Who, I think you just got a taste there of what a remarkable level of expertise Nobuo has. Uh, he is, uh, he's not just a leader in the energy sector internationally, but there's really, uh, it's hard to find anybody who knows more about this field than Nabuo. It's a very rich presentation. Um, so I, I, have, I have thoughts about a number of things you just said, but I have a presentation which is shorter. Uh, and I'm just going to throw out a few ideas about the Chinese energy economy, Nabuo, and then we can have a conversation um, about, this, about this afterwards. Um, this is a picture of Shanghai in 1983. Um, two years before that, in 1981, I was part of an exchange program uh, is one of the first exchange programs ever held between China and the United States after normalization of relations between our two countries. It turns out that exchange program was hosted by the Columbia Law School. So it's really fun to be here um, uh, in the Columbia Law School recalling that summer 32 years ago. Um, it was actually at the time, it was it actually, it was, it is my only affiliation with Columbia University before joining here as a fellow a couple of months ago. So it's really, but it was a very important event in my life. And it was a very different Shanghai. Uh, there, was, there was that summer in Shanghai exactly one international telephone line in the entire city that we could use to call home. And we would take a cab to the Huping Hotel every weekend in order to call home. Uh, and then we would take a cab back to Huadong Shifan Dashui, where we were studying, um, and, uh, and then come back the following weekend. Uh, it, was, it was an extraordinary experience. Uh, and, and as I said, helped to shape my, my career. This is the same place today. Um, so, in the course of my adult lifetime, the Bund in Shanghai has changed from that to that. Uh, and I just, I just uh, to, to, to shift a bit. I just spent four years working for Steve Chu. Some of you know uh, of he's. He was the U.S. Energy Secretary uh, for the first Obama term, and, and he's a winner of the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics. He, um, a quite unusual profile for a cabinet secretary to be a Nobel Prize winner. And I'm not a scientist by training. And after spending a couple of months with him, I found he kept on using this phrase, existence proof. And I, after a month or two, I said, Mr. Secretary, what is an existence proof? That's not a familiar term to me. Um, and he said, the idea of an existence proof is simple. An existence proof just means if it happened, then it's possible. Um, and, and that's a concept that's used in physics, and some scientists know here. And, uh, and so this is an ex I think that this transition is an existence proof of the possibility of extraordinary change in our world. If anybody ever says to you that they doubt that extraordinary things can happen, just look at that, what, what happened in 32 years, and the Chinese uh, have obviously, Chinese leadership have obviously pulled hundreds of millions of people from poverty. People call this the most successful anti-poverty program in the history of the world. And what's just happened here, and it's, it's obviously has very significant implications for the energy economy, not just for China, but for the world. And that's what I'll spend just, just a few minutes talking about. So one obvious implication from, of what's happening in China for the energy economy is what's happening in buildings in China. So. And, and what, what happened over the past 32 years is continuing. China, um, China today, or the United States today has 300 billion, floor 300 billion square feet of floor space. China is going to add that same amount in the next 15 to 20 years. So China is projected to add in the next 15 to 20 years as much square footage in its buildings as exists in the United States today. Um, and so if you're, if you're looking for a place uh, to kind of affect the trajectory of, say, global greenhouse gas emissions, improving the energy efficiency of the Chinese building stock is about as good a place as there is to do it. Um, and, and there's a lot of interesting work underway on this, both in the Chinese government and, and multilaterally and bilaterally with the United States. Um, some people have called China the Saudi Arabia of energy efficiency opportunities. It's a very favorable way of framing the issue. Um, China t uh, partly is a legacy of socialist planned economy, um, ha has a pretty, and partly is a re result of its economic structure, which relies very heavily on manufacturing um, and heavy manufacturing, uh, has a quite energy inefficient economy. Um, and here's the basic data. This is energy consumed in million BTUs per unit of GDP. 
and you see the comparison with Japan, China has almost, uses almost twice as much energy to generate a unit of GDP as Japan does, um, and more than India. So it's, it's not just a level of development issue. Um, there are a number of other factors. So there are really extraordinary opportunities for improving energy efficiency in, in China and extraordinary attention focused on this among the Chinese leadership. The five year, each of the last couple of five-year plans have had very specific targets for energy efficiency. Um, they've had a very, there's been a very serious infrastructure for trying to achieve those targets, um, and, and that continues. Um, and, and, and you see here, th this shows, it's the time series, and it shows that China, although it remains very inefficient, has improved dramatically um, over the course of the past couple of decades. Um, still remains very high, um, but, but the, the, the first derivative is downward. Um, what's happening in the Chinese auto markets is unbelievable. As anybody who's spent time in any of the major city has experienced, the traffic is incredible. This is a, shows the purchases of Chinese vehicles. I was in, Sh in Shanghai a couple of months ago, and I asked somebody who works for GM there, said, you're now at 20 million vehicles sold per year. Um, and by the way, for those who don't know these statistics, the United States is at about 12 or 13 now, I guess. We're up to 13 million vehicles sold. So China surpassed the United States in terms of total vehicles sold a couple of years ago, and it's just sh shooting off. I, I said, you're at 20 million. Do you think you're going to hit 30 million? And he laughed, and he said, we will hit 40 million. Uh, that's 40 million new vehicles a year sold. Today in the United States, there's a, a little bit less than one vehicle per person. In China today, there's about one vehicle for every eight people. So the potential of the Chinese uh, market to absorb new um, automotos, automobiles is extraordinary. Obviously, it's very profound impact on oil demand globally. Um, one th uh, the data on, on oil demand in China is actually not that good. Um, partly as a result, that the Chinese are, are continuing to fill up their strategic stocks. Um, and Nabua's experience with this, very deep experience. But, but the exact amount that's going to the strategic stocks um, is not always clear. Um, and so there's it's very interesting and important questions about exactly how much is being used by Chinese consumers in these vehicles. And it's actually some research that we're, we're launching at the center in this area. Let's talk about shale gas for a moment, um, which is another important issue in China. Um, China has extraordinary shale gas reserves. By some estimates, not all estimates, China has the biggest shale gas reserves in the world. Um, not all of them are, are so-called marine shales, which are the best and most accessible shales. Um, but both in, uh, in Xinjiang, up in the far northwest, and then in the Sichuan Basin, there is uh, very significant shale and beginning efforts to produce it. And, and uh, Nabuo visited uh, one of these uh, initial production wells. Um, the, the Chinese government has very aggressive targets for, for shale gas production at this point. Both they have a, There's a 2015 target and a 2020 target. I think the general consensus, even among most Chinese observers, is fair to say, is that it's going to be challenging to hit those targets. Um, and there's a variety of issues. The, the below ground issues are um, challenging in China. The, although it's a good resource in China, um, it's in general deeper than the shale in the United States. And, and um, in many places, there's, there's issues with mountainous terrain where the recovery is. Um, there's a, a, also a variety of above ground issues in recovering chi uh, shale from China. There's um, water shortages in Xinjiang up in the far northwest. Um, is a very uh, water stressed region. And it's not clear how you would get enough water to the region for large-scale fracking. Um, and there's also, as, as Nabuo mentioned, there's, um, there's issues involving price controls and industrial structure that will be a challenge for uh, large-scale development of shale. But, um, but the potential for shale to replace coal generation um, in, sh in parts of China is definitely there. And the Chinese leadership has been, so fo has been f very focused on air pollution as a challenge. And certainly shale gas production and natural gas generally has, an has the potential to make a big difference there. Uh, here's uh, this comparison of natural gas pipelines um, in different continents. And, and this is another barrier in China. Right now, China does not have the natural gas pipeline network that we have in the United States and that we benefited from when we launched our, um, uh, uh, when shale gas revolution really started about five years ago. Um, I, I think it is certainly not out of the question that, that the pipeline network could be built in China, um, but it will be an extra step in order to produce large amounts of shale. 
let's talk about clean energy. This is a slide produced by um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. What they mean by clean energy is renewables, and uh, I think in this context. Um, and uh, China's been one of the world's largest uh, investors in, in renewables for years and was in 2012 the largest investor in renewables. Um, Chinese wind production um, it, uh, is the top in the world. Um, Chinese now have most of solar manufacturing um, in the world, which has been a source of contention and trade disputes, both with the United States and Europe, because of subsidies there. Um, but, but there's now significant capacity for solar production in China, and, uh, and in new programs in China for domestic demand for PV, for pho photovoltaic cells. Um, so there's now new programs for feed-in tariffs in China for solar, um, and very significant effort to scale up renewable power in China. Nuclear power is extremely important in China today. Uh, half of the world's nuclear plants are being built um, in China. Um, Secretary Moniz, the current U.S. Energy Secretary, was just in China a couple weeks ago and during that trip emphasized the importance of, of nuclear power both to China and in the U.S.-China bilateral relationship. Um, there are four Westinghouse EP1000 plants in American technology that are being built in China, the possibility of, of more. And an interesting part of Secretary Moniz's trip, actually, was he emphasized how the U.S. and China have the potential to work together to sell nuclear technology in third country markets. And there is a tender right now in the United Kingdom where the U.S. and China, according to press accounts, may work together. So, so very interesting percent under, underway there. Um, I realize I don't have any slides on coal, um, which is 70 percent of uh, Chinese production, so it's at least worth saying a word about that, even if I keep a, nu a nuclear reactor on the screen. And, and, and actually, uh, Mr. Tanaka didn't really talk about um, coal that much either. So let's say, say a word about coal. Um, it is, of course, overwhelmingly um, the largest energy source uh, in, in China today. Um, one thing I found um, of interest in my visits to China in the past six months is for the first time the leadership is talking about capping the, the consumption of coal. And, and they're talking about in the 2020s, actually, coal consumption declining in China, which is an interesting move. Um, there's enormous efforts to use the most efficient coal burning technologies in China. Um, and, uh, uh, and for the first time, we started to see um, you know, significant coal imports in China, including from the United States. And there's political battles right now in the Western United States about the possibility of shipping coal to China. Um, so we can talk more about coal issues in, the, in discussion if you want. I'd say, I'd just say, just say in, oh, um, uh, I want to say a word about some bilateral programs that we, and multilateral programs that we're engaging with China. And this is one that I was personally involved in. So um, yeah, about four years ago, the United States and China launched the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center. Um, and I have here the leading U.S. institutions in this area. The, the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center now has 1,000 researchers actually working across dozens of different institutions in the U.S. and China. And the Coal Consortium is headed by, the West, by West Virginia University of the United States, the Vehicles Consortium by Michigan, University of Michigan, and the, Energy, the Building Efficiency Consortium is headed by the Lawrence, excuse me, the, the Berkeley um, Lab. Um, and uh, this has been a very successful program. Um, that's really taken off in terms of interest between the two countries working together to try to produce innovation uh, in clean energy. Uh, and then uh, there is, uh, for four years in a row now, been a clean energy ministerial that's brought energy ministers from around the world together um, to talk about clean energy uh, cooperation. And China's been a very active participant. The Ministry of Science and Technology from uh, China and, and Wang Gang as the minister has been a very active participant in this program. So there's a kind of web of relationships here um, that are extremely important uh, on energy cooperation. Um, in closing, I spent, um, I spent a day in Shanghai a year or two ago, kind of as, a, as another counterpoint to my experience 32 years ago, but I spent a day where I visited a 2.2 gigawatt coal plant in the morning. And for those who aren't energy experts, that's twice as big as your standard big coal plant. It's a 2.2 gigawatt coal plant. It had, it had ultra supercritical boilers. They were claiming 45% high heating value thermal efficiency, which I'm not sure if that's true, is probably the leading in the world. Um, I went from that plant to the largest solar manufacturing facility in the world. Um, the next morning, drove by the bullet train that takes you to the airport at a 
180 miles an hour, which is twice what the Acela, roughly twice what the Acela goes between Washington and, and New York, past this 1,000 kilovolt transmission line coming into the city, which is state of the art. State of the art in the United States is, I think, about 720, 760 kilovolts. Um, to one of the most amazing energy or automotive test and designing facilities I've ever seen. So th that those 48 hours kind of capsule encapsulated for me the extraordinary amount of investment um, into the energy technology that's happened, energy technology is happening in China right now, and how China is helping to shape the world's energy future. Um, so with that, I will um, turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Manuel for inviting me here and uh, Jason for hosting the event. Um, I mean, it's a huge honor and pleasure to be in a conference with such uh, distinguished and uh, experts and, and speakers uh, to such an extent that I would say that it was an, an audacious invitation uh, by Manuel to have me here. Um, so in any case, I'll, I'll benefit from uh, all that has already been said uh, and uh, we'll be able to go quickly uh, through the slides. Uh, I'll basically present a simulating tool that uh, we developed at EDP uh, that allows you to uh, project what could be the future evolution of the Chinese energy system according to uh, your own vision, the, the user's vision of different variables like uh, uh, energy efficiency, uh, the evolution, the take-up rate of different technologies and so on. So uh, before I get there, I just uh, a very quick uh, overview of the Chinese energy system and again, uh, taking the advantage that uh, much already has been said. Just starting by um, looking at the evolution of the past uh, four decades, uh, uh, comparing the primary energy demand evolution uh, of the three main blocks, China, US, and, uh, and Europe. And back in the 70s, uh, China was really a marginal player in the global energy um, scene. Uh, and basically the West, US, and Europe were the main uh, energy consumers. Um, the energy demand in China has been steadily going up, but especially uh, since the year 2000, uh, the slope changed disruptively and it increased very, very significantly. And as uh, Professor Ping mentioned, basically in the last decade, every year China uh, has been adding the equivalent of the UK to the, to the energy system. Uh, it has added basically almost the equivalent of the European Union in the last 15 years. So that really has changed very significantly uh, the whole landscape. And it has overcome uh, the US as the leading country in terms of energy demand. Uh, so it currently accounts for one fifth uh, of all energy demand in the world. Uh, but of course, if you look at average consumption per capita, it still lags behind uh, most uh, Western countries, uh, especially when you look at the, at the US, uh, which basically tells you that there, there is still a lot of room to go, a lot of more consumption uh, growth to expect just to catch up with average uh, comfort uh, levels and energy consumption levels uh, standards for uh, other uh, main countries. Now, uh, what has been the evolution of the structure of this primary energy demand? Uh, you have uh, on the left side uh, the evolution with 20 years intervals uh, in China. And of course, what really strikes us not only is the rapid pace at which it, it grew, but also the sheer size of coal in the whole energy mix. Uh, in, and on the right hand side, you can compare it, uh, this structure, with the US and Europe's uh, structure. And really, you see that two thirds of primary energy demand in China are based on coal. That compares with only 22% in the US and 16% uh, in the EU. So it's a radically different uh, energy mix. Uh, oil, which accounts for more than one third of uh, energy demand in, in the Western world, it's only 17% in China. And perhaps even more striking, uh, gas, which accounts for one-fourth of energy consumption in the West, it's not even 5% in, in the Chinese energy mix. So it's a radically different system. Uh, and I tend to say that, I mean, um, we tend to look at uh, coal in China as a, a big problem, big problem for uh, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
but I tend to look at, uh, look at it with a more positive tone, and I would say that uh, coal and growth in coal usage in China has basically contributed to world peace in the last decade, uh, because it was really the, own, the only uh, resource uh, that could ramp up locally quickly to meet uh, the rising demand in, in China. Uh, had it not uh, be, been able to resort to its local uh, coal, it would have to uh, basically go to the international markets and start buying gas, oil, and that would have been a huge pressure to the international energy system that perhaps would not have been able to cope with such uh, rapid development. Uh, now, uh, looking at the International Energy Agency's projection for the next uh, 20 years, uh, we effectively see that this growth uh, will slow down a little bit, but will still continue very strong. There are different scenarios, but if you look, take the uh, central new policy scenario from the IEA, you see that the expectation is that energy demand will still grow by 50% in the next 20 years, uh, and so it will dwarf uh, the European Union's uh, uh, energy consumption. Um, the US's energy consumption is also expected to be stable. So clearly, uh, uh, China will uh, assert itself even more as the largest energy consumer in the world. Um, in terms of structure, uh, it takes a long time to make really significant differences in any energy system because it has huge inertia associated. Uh, but even in this new policy scenario, you see that coal is expected to gradually lose uh, its share in the overall Chinese energy mix. But still by 2035 in this scenario, it will still account for more than 50% of total primary energy demand, which will still be a major difference when you compare it to other energy mixes. Now, um, we took the challenge of thinking a little bit beyond this 20-year horizon and, and uh, just using very simple variables like energy intensity, carbon intensity, energy efficiency, uh, vehicle penetration per capita, and so on and so on. Uh, using these very uh, elementary variables, uh, what could be the evolution of uh, China's uh, energy consumption? Um, and that's uh, how we came up with this tool. Um, well, just start by saying that uh, for the near future, um, up to 2020, China has already set itself uh, several targets for the energy field under these five-year plans. It's a, it's a planned economy. So uh, up to 2015, uh, under the 12th five-year plan, there are already uh, specific targets for uh, renewable energy in the primary uh, energy, carbon intensity reduction, and so on. Uh, and when you look at the 13th five-year plans for the targets that are already uh, being discussed, uh, these are pretty ambitious. Uh, renewable energy is expected to climb to 15% of primary energy, uh, starting from a base of around 10% today. Uh, so increasing five percentage points uh, in a system that is growing so rapidly will imply growing even more quickly this kind of uh, resource. So that, that will be a, an extremely important effort. Uh, and I would also draw your attention to this carbon intensity reduction uh, of 40 to 45 percent, um, which is really ambitious if you think that uh, neither Europe nor the US achieved in a 15-year time frame for the past six, seven decades uh, of recorded data on this uh, have never achieved actually uh, such a carbon intensity reduction, uh, which tells you that this is really ambitious. But of course, uh, climate change is an absolute issue. It's not a relative issue. So uh, GDP is expected to grow so fast that even if carbon intensity uh, goes down, uh, the total amount of greenhouse gases is expected still uh, to grow. Now. What about uh, beyond 2020? So that's what leads us to uh, the simulator that, uh, that we uh, implemented. Uh, uh, I'll show you quickly. Uh, this is publicly available. It's in, you know, on the internet. I'll show you the, the link. Uh, but basically, the user is asked a series of, of questions about whether he believes in a lot of electric vehicles or not so much, a lot of wind, a lot of gas, a lot of nuclear. Uh, so the user can. Uh, get uh, different perspectives on different variables. And automatically, what you see is 
uh, the, the simulator plotting. So how will, according to your views, uh, primary energy demand evolve, uh, final energy, uh, power generation, electrification of society, greenhouse gases, and so on and so on. Um, and of course, I mean, just uh, for those that have more uh, sensitivity to, to the numbers, uh, I mean, the, the, the values that are um, in, these, uh, in, in, in these multiple choice uh, answers are staggering. I mean, just uh, uh, even if you put like 200 gigawatts of wind, which is absolutely huge, it's basically uh, uh, all wind installed capacity in the world. Uh, and when you look at the difference that it makes in the graph uh, for China, it's really tiny. So uh, quantities are uh, really very, very um, uh, smashing. Um, so there are, I won't go in, into detail, uh, I'll, I'll invite you to, to go to the web, web link and, uh, and play a little bit with the simulator. There are, there are questions on prices, energy demand, generation, CO2 uh, emission technologies like CCS. So this is, uh, this is, uh, this is the link if you want to, uh, and I strongly in, invite you to, uh, and uh, just understand the, the sheer uh, challenge that uh, China faces in order to really make a difference uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and 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 the likes. Um, to 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 end the presentation, I just uh, did a very quick exercise for the purpose of this of this conference uh, to define three stylized scenarios, very contrasting scenarios, just to to make it a little bit more fun um, and. Um, uh, so there are some common uh, hypotheses that uh, that we assumed. Uh, so price-wise, uh, we simply assumed the uh, long-term average values that the IEA projects uh, for oil, coal, natural gas. We assumed some kind of CO2 price uh, up to 2050, uh, even in China. Um, we assumed that population will basically remain constant. I mean, as you may imagine, I mean, just adding or subtracting uh, 200 million inhabitants in China in the next four decades will, of course, uh, make a huge uh, effect. So we assume that population will remain constant. We assume that GDP per capita will uh, double from today's level to 2050, which um, admittedly is a very modest assumption. Uh, it might very easily be double this, double this amount, so closer to $20,000 per capita. Um, energy intensity, some, some, some average values, um, no imports assumed, and no carbon capture and sequestration assumed. I mean, just to make it simple, but of course, uh, this might not be a re realistic, and I challenge you to, uh, to use different assumptions. Um, now, the scenarios uh, we, de we, we defined here, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not making any prejudgment on whether uh, they are realistic or not, uh, or, or which one is more realistic than the other, um, but just to understand what possible contrasting evolutions there could, there could be, um, we thought of a king coal scenario. So it's essentially a business as usual scenario where you keep on relying heavily on, on coal. Um, a shale ga gas scenario where the shale gas revolution in the US uh, is replicated in China. Uh, shale gas uh, is ramped up very significantly. They go into fuel switching in the transport area. So we assume that, for example, 75% by 2050 uh, of road and non-road transportation switches uh, to, to natural gas and a bit of biofuels as well. Um, and that uh, natural gas uh, is ramped up in the power sector and 2,000 gigawatts uh, so double the, the whole installed capacity in the U.S. right now uh, are installed uh, in, in gas capacity to make it the dominant um, uh, fuel of the future in, in China. So this is the shale gas scenario. Okay? Uh, and the third scenario is the renewables and electrification scenario. Uh, what we, we assume here is that there is a stronger focus on energy efficiency. Um, 
one of the things that is really striking is that because half of energy consumption in China uh, is uh, for the industrial sector, compared to just about 20% in the Western world, uh, whatever you do in the energy efficiency for industry really affects the whole dynamics and the whole size of the system. So we assumed here there would be a significant gains in, in energy efficiency for industry, and that also demand is progressively electrified, so heating is more and more uh, produced by electric heaters and not just by burning gas or wood at home. Um, and also, um, you don't have gasification of transports as in the second scenario, but you have a switch to electricity in the transport sector. Okay. Now, what, what would be the results in these different scenarios? Uh, Using uh, and taking, remembering the uh, the projections by the the IEA, uh, these would be uh, the results. So in in King Coal, you would still have uh, a diminishing share of um, of uh, of coal in the energy mix, but that would be very much pronounced in the shale gas scenario, where basically you would uh, have this big wedge of natural gas uh, coming in and dominating the the matrix in the future. And the third scenario, uh, again, coal, the share of coal would, would come down significantly uh, at the expense, let's say, of renewable energy and a bit of nuclear uh, as well. Uh, what would this entail in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, it's what you can see in the, in the left-hand side graph. Um, so uh, we, we have these different uh, greenhouse gas uh, scenarios. King Coal, of course, would keep on uh, increasing uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, almost doubling the current value. Uh, under the renewables and electrification scenario, you would have a very significant reduction in, uh, in emissions. But I've put there uh, the range in red uh, that the IEA projects for its current policies, new policies, and 450 scenario. Uh, and you can see that even in this ambitious renewables and electrification scenario that we have uh, defined here, we would stay by uh, 2035 pretty much above the emissions level that uh, the 450 uh, scenario from IEA uh, forecasts. And remember, this 450 scenario is basically uh, what you should be having to really uh, contain the temperature increase by uh, up to two degrees. Um, in terms of final energy and primary energy demand, uh, basically we uh, had a focus on energy efficiency essentially on the third scenario, renewables and electrification, and you see that that can make a very, very significant uh, difference. So it's like 40% less of uh, final energy demand in this uh, third scenario. Um, when, you look, when you look at primary energy um, and keeping the drivers of demand uh, constant between the King Coal scenario and the shale gas scenario, just by switching to a more efficient uh, technology, which, which is gas combined cycle, gas turbines compared to uh, even supercritical uh, coal uh, turbines, you would still have uh, a gain on primary energy of uh, about 10% simply from switching on the supply side from coal to gas. Um, well, we, we have also just created a uh, synthetic indicator of difficulty of implementation because you can have very um, cheap uh, solutions actually don't find that many, but uh, there are cheaper solutions than others, cheaper technologies than others, but they may have uh, a big uh, social resistance, public acceptance, acceptance issues. So we created this indicator that in a way measures how difficult a given scenario is to implement. And of course, this renewables and electrification scenario is very difficult because it will require significant pressure and change of behavior from, from uh, people, from industries, and so on. Uh, but there is a big price to, to gain in terms of energy cost of the system, um, which in this particular case could, uh, could, could mean almost a 27% reduction in, in total cost. And I would end with this slide uh, just with a, a glimpse of sensitivity analysis to different uh, to different variables. Of course, 
wealth GDP per capita because it drives energy consumption is a hugely sensitive uh, variable. Uh, again, we have used as our base case just assuming a doubling of current GDP per capita in China. If you assume that by 2050 uh, the average wealth uh, in China will be the same as current US GDP per capita, then you would almost multiply by four uh, the amount of uh, energy uh, that China consumes. Uh, 16 gigatons of oil equivalent, which is what would happen in this, uh, this scenario, is, means that China would consume uh, itself the same as the world as a whole uh, is currently consuming or is expected to be consuming in the next 20 years. Uh, so, so this really gives you an idea that uh, wealth which we expect to be uh, uh, the greater the best, the, the better, um, would have, of course, a huge impact. Um, industry energy intensity, as I mentioned, is a, a very important lever also to manage uh, total energy consumption. If by 2050, energy intensity in China is uh, the same as today's US energy intensity, then you would almost half uh, have um, primary energy consumption in, in China. Of course, this is not only, I mean, you, you do not move from a 120 tons of oil equivalent per, per million uh, dollar to a 20 ton of oil equivalent per million dollar just by improving the efficiency of the existing manufacturing facilities. It's a question of industrial policy of uh, changing the whole mix of industries that, uh, that China will have in the future. I mean, it, it is currently specialized in lower value add, uh, high energy intensive industries. Uh, to, to get to this lower energy intensity, it's simply changing, going up the ladder to more high value added uh, industries, services, and so on. Um, and finally, of course, if you increase vehicle penetration, uh, for example, to current US vehicle penetration, then of course you would have a much greater share of transport in energy consumption and with that greater oil uh, consumption, pressure uh, from imports in the Middle East and Africa and, and so on. So this was basically it. Thank you very much. Um, I'd turn things over to uh, Manuel now, um, and uh, they, the panelists might have questions for each other. I'd allow them to react for a few minutes, but we have about 20 minutes left. Um, and then afterwards, if there's any time for questions, we'd uh, invite you to come down, um, state your name and affiliation, and please make your question a uh, question. Thank you. Thank you. First, uh, congratulations. These were two fanta three fantastic uh, presenters. Just uh, uh, if I may start with the first question. Uh, the, the figures for China are staggering. Uh, they, they are really very impressive. And I just call your attention to the fact that these projections are assuming that uh, income per capita will double between now and 2050. And that means a growth rate of less than 2% a year. 2%, uh, which is unlikely. You know, taking, for example, the, the, the estimates of the IMF, which are about 75 until the end of the decade, that would create such a speed that it would involve recession, <laughs> negative growth in, in the last decade. So most likely, this will be your third assumption, multiplying by three. And by three, you know, this shows how the, I, I know that the UK is very important, but the UK is one, one China per year, and compound growth will create, I mean, an incredible effect. <laughs> yes, that's true. The IEA expect about, uh, let's say, the Chinese economic growth gradually decline, um, but uh, in their assumption, the growth rate, not per capita, but the uh, economic growth rate will uh, about will be about five percent. Uh, so. Uh, so, so, so this makes a huge difference um, in, 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 in by the assumptions. 
and uh, uh, this slowing down is inevitable and but also the per, still the per capita uh, level is uh, uh, about half of the OECD countries so w w is this the kind of a limit for the economic growth or not um, but half of the population means i mean uh, half of half of the per capita uh, uh, gdp means that half of the population is as high as oecd average so in fact uh, this is uh, the china's economic assumption case is always the big uncertainty or whatever the big question mark of these assumptions makes a huge difference in any parameters and uh, in the ias uh, uh, say pre uh, projections or scenarios, this uncertainty creating huge problem because if China changes, for example, policy on on coal development, and in Xinjiang province there's a huge potential resources on, on coal, and uh, if China is seriously develop these coal mines and then also built the logistics of uh, supply, the railroad. So China can be easily the exporter of coal, not importer. And this makes a huge difference in, 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 in the coal market around the world. So China uh, case is always very difficult to make good prediction in the future. And also CO2 emission is very interesting in your case. Yes, each case has a different um, uh, scenarios. But if Chinese economy further slow down, it could happen the peaking of CO2 may come much earlier than expected. Currently, the peaking of CO2 emission arrives in beyond 2035 or something, but it's coming closer to 2025. I talk with many Chinese experts of that, and many say it, it may happen in 2025 or even earlier. If that's the case, it's coming very close to the IA's 450 scenario. So difficult to, to make a good guess, but um, Chinese, uh, let's say, uh, efforts as well as the uh, policy uh, decision makes a huge difference. So I think if China, when China commit many of the 12th uh, five-year plan numbers parameters, I think modestly uh, 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 setting the number means China can be much more ambitious to make uh, lots of, uh, let's say, efficiency or conservation efforts or use of the technology. So we'll see. But uh, as my manual worries about the parameters, but in fact. Uh, many things, or so-called green uh, paradigm of China, may change to miss, uh, dramatically the global uh, perspective because Chinese economic growth cannot be warranted without this kind of uh, very efficient green paradigm. No way to make economic growth as such. So China needs the huge change in the transportation sector, much more to the economy, uh, electric vehicle or something else, or a very efficient way of life. Otherwise, simply natural resources restrict the chi China's economic growth. Thank you. Uh, all right, if anyone has any questions, we'd welcome you to come down. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Tanaka. Uh, hi, um, Tanaka, uh, Mr. Tanaka. Of course, uh, I uh, China needs IEA, and of course, IEA needs China, right? So, do you think it is the high price of gas that inhibit the step of China to become a new member of IEA? And if your answer is yes, then um, you just mentioned that China could be a, a good a co-exporter, then it is a uh, it is appropriate for China to increase the price of coal. So this is a, the first question, and the second question is that you've mentioned that 
Now, China needs CCS. CCS is very important to China. But according to the uh, simulator 2050, uh, there will be no uh, power plant with CCS and no mitigation with CCS. So I'm, I'm really confused about what, how can CCS survive? OK, thank you. Yes. Second question first. Uh, CCS, yes, it is uh, the technology is there, but the problem is the price of the carbon. If the price of carbon is high enough, China certainly forced to use it. But it is um, the, the, uh, the sacrifice, the energy uh, uh, performance of the power plant. It's additional cost for any anybody implementing CCS. Um, the, the China is, I think, developing CCS technologies and applying and using it, um, testing it at this moment. Um, so it depends. If the, uh, China is part of the global uh, uh, mitigation efforts and committed to the cuts of CO2 emission, then CCS is simply must. And IEA's prediction is uh, projection is very interesting. The 450 ppm scenario restraining the CO2 emission by half by 2050 and two degrees Celsius increase to the end of the century. That scenario means carbon price is $120 per ton of the CO2. Will the global economy can? sustain itself by this price? This is a very interesting question. But if we really seriously chase the green sustainable scenario, that is a cost. And when the, the cost is levied, yes, CCS will happen. Technology is already there. Uh, the first part, IA and China, yes, uh, I think higher prices of uh, oil will push China for more efficiency, but at the same time, uh, 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 say needs for more stability uh, of the price as well as supply. So higher the oil price, I think China feels more the vulnerability and working much closer with IEA, I think. And it is the mutual interest. Yes, China needs stability. and uh, uh, say uh, to get working closely with IA means, yes, China should build the uh, strategic stockpile, 90 days, and use it together with IA. And, and, and in case China suffers the disruption and the loss of supply, then I, other IA countries will help China to be supplied. So this is a definitely the mutual win-win situation. So when I was... Uh, uh, elected as um, executive director, I visited China and asked this question, when China is ready to join the IA? The answer was five years, because my term is just four years. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> Already five years has passed since I asked that question, but uh, China hasn't yet been a member. So this is uh, difficult, but... Uh, if China is not joining IA, Chinese intention is building new IA in Asia under its leadership. I, maybe you may call it Shanghai Organization or not, but that is possible option. And um, we'll see. I mean, this is uh, the, the, what kind of, um, let's say, uh, China and India import, import is as big as OECD eventually, right? So the, how? these two countries manage the uh, security or price stability certainly making the difference. So if China so wish, you can create one. And then the question is how other uh, current IA members will behave. Should they join the new organization? This is an interesting question. Just t two quick comments about that. Uh, on, the, on the IEA question. First, since we're here in the law school, maybe it's worth pointing out there's some legal issues involved with China joining the IEA. The, I, the treaty that the IEA is formed under with the OECD 
dates back to the 1970s and in a very different world. And um, China would, as I understand it, need to become a member of the OECD in order to become a member of the IEA. And that presents some legal barriers. They may not be insurmountable, but they're significant just from a pure joining of membership standpoint. That doesn't prevent China from cooperating with the IEA in some very important ways, and that's been growing uh, and I think continues to grow. Uh, and actually, as a, a U.S. government official about a year ago, I visited a Chinese strategic petroleum reserve site and was told I was the first U.S. official to do that. Um, and it's quite an extraordinary site with tens of millions of barrels um, and uh, and extraordinary fire control mechanisms, and it's part of a, a continued very serious effort on the part of the Chinese government to build up uh, strategic stocks and use them in the case of an emergency. I'd like just to make a, a quick comment on, on the CCS question. China has a lot of carbon locked in uh, with the current uh, coal fleet that it has installed. It has been installing at the rate of one coal plant a week. So you have very rec a very recent coal fleet uh, that under normal circumstances they would last for 40 years. So if China wants to reduce the emissions that are embedded in those assets for the future, it either has to install CCS or it will have a lot of stranded assets. So it, it scraps those plants and replaces them by gas generation, renewables, whatever. Uh, so, I mean, the second option is economically uh, a bit uh, daunting. So I would say that uh, the focus on retrofitting these plants with CCS will be enormous. I'm just a bit worried that uh, uh, physically um, CCS is a big challenge. I mean, storing the, the volume of CO2 that comes out of those uh, plants one year is absolutely huge, so finding uh, a, an economic and viable way to store all those emissions is something that really worries me. Uh, but the alternative really would be to strand those assets, which is also not very uh, interesting. A final uh, issue is that the simulator itself doesn't assume anything regarding CCS. I mean, it, it's there as an option for people to say no CCS will be put in place or up to 100 uh, percent of plants will be retrofitted in the future with, with CCS. So it's, it's, it's up to uh, user, each user put there what, what they think will, will happen. Okay. Um, we unfortunately lose the room in a few minutes, but we have time for one more question. So we took one from over here, so we'll just go right here. Uh, thank you for the privilege. And uh, my question is for the whole panel, whoever is uh, concerned. As far as I know, if, uh, yeah, just for the, the, the IEA IE and then China cooperation problem, uh, is it because the China is a little bit more conservative to the, uh, for the current energy structure because it doesn't want to worse off its relation with OPEC? So and the IEA cannot answer for the question that uh, how China will benefit from joint or cooperation with the IEA. The, and is it because it is a struggle uh, problem? And my main question is that uh, as far as I know, there are many other factors. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Professor Pelela just uh, just mentioned. Uh, China might fail to reach its um, 2015 goal, the shale gas goal, and there are many reasons behind this. First, uh, like the technique and stuff, because China has a worse natural endowment than than USA, and to develop the shale gas, and uh, and this will increase its cost. And secondly, because gas is relatively cheaper in China as the government uh, manipulates. And third, there might be water in, uh, shortage and pollution, as mentioned, and this really requires a uh, harder uh, supervision and surveillance, but which is very weak in China. Uh, and, and fourth, that there might not an interest group. Uh, it's, um, th there might be struggle for the overlapping rights of mining uh, for the new companies to develop shale gas. Uh, with uh, like PetroChina, with the SOE, uh, so there might be, so I can, uh, uh, I mean, there there is this sort of uh, concerns and prudence in China, uh, the debate for shale gas. So I mean, what what is the endogenous incentive and external stimulation 
that China needs to uh, to meet the global expectation. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we've got a chance for a quick response from each um, panelist, and then we have to wrap it up. So, thank you. Uh, the first question about OPEC uh, IEA in China. Yes, yeah, certainly China needs more OPEC than IEA. Well, but at the same time, uh, there's a risk. So, I think the real reason China cannot join the IEA is probably the nature of the IEA is very strat geopolitical at the beginning. So created by Henry Kissinger and others to face the challenge from OPEC. Um, and in case, for example, let's think about the possibility of Israel and the United States uh, started the battle with Iran. And Hormuz Strait is blocked. Then IEA will release stockpile. Will China join this operation? This is a very interesting question, right? So China needs kind of uh, uh, opt-out option to join the IEA. Will jo IEA will be ready to provide that kind of option? I don't know. This is an interesting question. So if China joins, another big reason for the current members is that if China joins, the votes, voting right of China will be as big as the United States because it depends on the oil uh, consumption of the country. So the smaller European countries are very much worried about the China-India joins and majority moves away from Europe. So before China's uh, intention of joining or not, there are certain barriers in the IEA to overcome. This change of governance is another big barrier for China to join, I think. The second question, probably I will <laughs> give the answer to uh, David for the shale revolution, yes, but uh, I think, yes, you're right. The technical problems, uh, the problems of the lack of pipeline system is another very important, probably, thing. You mentioned very good, all these points are relevant, but um, there are many, many reasons for that, that, shale, uh, that China should overcome the obstacle for the shale development. But I was told by the CNPC guy that China is on the learning curve. So it's getting faster and faster of developing the shale, I think. But we're, we're out of time. And I, as I can say, we're out of time. I think it's appropriate that Tanaka-san should have the last word. <laughs> so, so I will talk to you afterwards and answer your question. Thank you very much.